as a bishop, a successor of the apostles, for almost 12 years, I've constantly been humbled by that reality. Successor of the apostles. Impossible for me, really, as a kid from East Texas, an impossible call to live up to. But for whatever reasons, through salvation history, God chooses the little, the insignificant, the powerless, the not so smart. And so I qualify. As John Henry mentioned, almost a year ago, we were there at the Rome Life Forum when I said yes to John Henry's invitation. I, I really wasn't sure what that rose was, Rome Life Forum. It was there in Rome. The Synod of 2023 was continuing, and I wasn't so sure I wanted to be in Rome at that time. But I accepted John Henry's invitation and said some things that some found to be scandalous, others proclaimed to be bold. But I have to say, a year later, I said those challenging things about our church because of my love for Christ because of my knowledge that he is Lord and that he remains with us in all the power and all the glory of his presence in the world. Now, as we mark our time in his name in the year 2024, let's be aware, why do we call this 2024? Because it's been that many years, 2,024 years since his incarnation, since he was conceived in the womb of Mary. Yes, I know there are questions about the calendar, and there are all kinds of questions, but we know Christ is Lord, no question. And so as we gather a year after the, the Rome Life Forum in Rome, and a year ahead of 2025 when it will return to Rome, all that I hope to do with you for a few minutes is share my love for Jesus Christ and the strong and powerful call that I hear for all of us, not just for me as a bishop, not just for the wonderful priests like the priests that assisted me right here, at the sacred liturgy. But I hope that if there's anything worthwhile about what you hear from me this morning, I know the talks, one thing about it, the way they've organized this conference, the talks will keep getting better. <laughs> this young lady will do a bang up job, I know because she is a woman of Jesus Christ. She loves our Lord. She knows him better than I. She's a theologian. I'm just a bishop. <laughs> but let us be aware. I'm presuming all of us here are baptized, and hopefully all of us are confirmed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it is the duty of all of us to guard the deposit of faith, to live Christ, to say no to the blasphemies, and to joyfully say yes to Christ every day in every way we possibly can. We've all read many things. We all have great concerns. But one of the, the smartest things that I've read from various saints and prophetic utterances and visionaries, it will be the laity 
who bring the church back to the sacred heart of Jesus, to her rightful place, to be the vessel that guides humanity in the truth. And who are the laity? I prefer to speak of them in terms of the sacraments, the baptized, and the confirmed. One thing that has constantly struck me in prayer, and as I travel around speaking about our faith, one thing that really continues to deepen in my understanding, and I'd encourage all of us to ponder what it means to be anointed in the Holy Spirit. You might say, "Uh uh-oh, the bishop seems to be going kind of charismatic here. Whoa, whoa. We use all kinds of labels. Let us be people of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Let us be people of Jesus Christ, seeking the Father. There's nothing that Jesus wants more. And the great mystery of his triune life as the second person of the Trinity, the Lord came to us to draw us into the life of God. And the Holy Spirit, we have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. And my sometimes frightening awareness through these 12 years has grown to be very clear. All of us, I'll presume, have been baptized and anointed with the Holy Spirit, called to be priest, prophet, and king. All of us, in no way, Does that discount the sacred orders that are vital to the church? But for priests and deacons and bishops to be who they are called to be in holy orders, they need the baptized living their anointing in the Spirit of God, in the very source of life. We have been anointed in life. So the work of LifeSite News is really the work of humanity, the work of all of us, to remember what life is about, who we are. There are many voices, even sadly from within the church, confusing us, speaking false messages, false gospels, As St. Paul says, let any speaking false gospels be accursed. That's strong language. Politically incorrect. Disruptive. Harsh and rigid. But if we know Jesus Christ, that clear language is the deepest message of love. Because because Christ tells us very clearly, we must separate ourselves from everything that is not of God and be more and more God's people. Those living in the one who gives us life. And I specifically use that tense. I need to. We all need to live remembering God is giving us life at this moment. I think there's a tendency for all of us. We sort of go on autopilot. We believe and we know that by God's wonderful grace, by God's will, We came to be it all. We were conceived in the womb of our mothers. We came to be born and to live. As the scriptures remind us so beautifully, like in the book of Job, none of us made that choice. None of us knew the choice was there. We were taken from non-existence to existence by God's love. And one of the strongest things we need to remember today 
as people of faith who know God in a godless world, that really we have to acknowledge in many ways has always been godless. Why did God send his son to wake us up to who we are, to what is true? But so easily, we kind of get lulled into forgetting that every breath we take is a sign of God's love, is a reminder God is loving us into being. The beauty of that is reminding us that it's a hands-on God for every one of us. It's hard to imagine. We can't fathom it. There are about 8 billion people on the earth today. And how many billions have come before us? How can God love each of us so individually? But he does. One of my theories is that all the turmoil we're seeing, if we had the chance to really have a heart-to-heart talk with every person that is spewing hatred and attacking and ignoring God, and vehemently proclaiming a godless world, if we had the chance to really speak to that person, I believe all of them would say, I don't know God's love. Because if we know God's love, we will begin with all of our failings, and I've got plenty but we will begin to be transformed like the saints. In these days, we celebrate St. Ignatius of Antioch and St. Margaret Mary Alico, two wonderfully different saints living in very different times. What do they have in common? I think we change the question Who do they have in common? And of course, it's Jesus Christ. St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote letters as he's being dragged off to be martyred. And he's joyful. He's hopeful. He's strong. He knows where he got his life. And he knows he will not lose his life even if they take his heart in this world. Because the heart of St. Ignatius of Antioch was with Jesus Christ, the sacred heart. In his time, in those earliest centuries of the church, the earliest decades of the church, maybe or maybe not they had the idea of that image, that beautiful image that we had on the screen of the sacred heart of Jesus, as John Henry mentioned. And I think it's probably true for many of us. My memory of the sacred heart as a child, one of my earliest memories, I've shared this before, was not a beautiful painting. It was a rather beat-up plaster statue. It was beat up because it had traveled from Australia to Texas. That'll beat anybody up. (laughs) It was the simple plaster statue that sat on my parents' dresser in their bedroom. One hand was broken off in shipment, But that image of the Sacred Heart stayed with me. And there were other images in our Catholic homes. That's one thing that we need to promote. And I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir, but share the good news of the choir with others, with your children, with your grandchildren, with neighbors. Make it a practice. What does somebody need for Christmas? If they don't have an image of the Sacred Heart in their home, that's who they need for Christmas, not another blender, (laughs) but an image of our Lord. The Sacred Heart continues for me as a priest and for the priests here. We need brothers 
and all of you who pray for your priests and love your priests, pray for us to grow in the tremendous understanding. When we, as I did a few moments ago, stand at the Eucharistic altar where bread, simple bread, becomes the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, we are holding the sacred heart in our hands. Domine non sum dignus. I have to say that with profound fervor and clarity. I will never be deserving. I will never be worthy. None of us can be worthy. But Jesus Christ, on the crucifix that I wear around my neck, on the crucifixes that adorn our sacred altars, on that cross, Jesus made us worthy. For priests and deacons and bishops who stand at the altar as sacred ministers, pray for them to really believe the words we're saying, the actions we're doing. May a genuflection be a true bending the knee at the name of Jesus that all of us are called to. But those in holy orders hold a sacred duty. And having been ordained in 1985 as through the curriculum vitae that John Henry shared, I was ordained at St. Monica's Church in Dallas in 1985 on June 1st. The world and the church at that moment were richly blessed. But much of that I didn't know. The traditional Latin Mass didn't exist for me as a newly ordained priest. And obviously, you witness, I'm still learning. But I need to. As a bishop, I need to learn all the rites of our beautiful Catholic faith. And we all need to be reminded that it's about the Lord and all the beautiful rites, the Maronite, the traditional Latin Mass, the Coptic, all of those are about coming to the presence of the Lord of the universe. Humanly speaking, I think I can speak for every priest. They're probably holier. I'm sure they're holier than I am, but the holiest of priests, even the saints, like the curie of ours, will speak intimately about the human frailty that is always right there with us on the altar. People like to kiss the bishop's ring, which you should, not because I'm holy, but because of the Episcopal office and its duty to remind us of Christ. That kissing of the ring is a blessing for you to connect a little more deeply to the sacred heart of our Savior, to be reminded of the duty of bishops and priests and deacons, to be sacred ministers. We need the sacred in a profane world. <clears throat> I like to say that we need to live as first-century Christians in the 21st century. And to me, that's a profound calling. It's not just a slogan, an idea, but who were the first-century Christians? Many of them were martyrs. Many of them, like St. Ignatius of Antioch, died for the name of Jesus. I know we've all had conversations wondering how prevalent will martyrdom, blood martyrdom, be in our time? It could become quite prevalent. 
If we don't make the right choices in this nation, in this year's election, we don't have great choices, but we have to make the best we can. And if this nation is foolish enough to choose leaders again who desanctify life, blaspheme God, and proclaim an atheistic agenda as a nation, we will reap exactly what we deserve if that choice is made. We may not like the choices we're given, but we have to make the best choices we can, not because of politics, but because of truth in Jesus Christ. And any leader that says we should be able to abort children at any point needs to be corrected and some of them claim to be beyond correction. If that's the case, then send them home. Don't send them to offices of leadership. We've got to rejoice in who we have. He is Lord. He is one. He is God's only divine Son, Jesus Christ. It truly is a travesty that leaders in the church seem to have a question about that or proclaim boldly that there are many paths to God the Father. I'll continue to listen to Jesus Christ, who said there, that He is the only path and he is wide open in invitation for all humanity. But we must turn from all that is not of God so that we can be more of God in our very essence of our being, to go back to where we came from. A large part of what inspires me as I speak to you about Jesus Christ is what inspires all of us, word and sacrament. In a sense, for the past 500 years, since the Protestant Reformation, which happened to start on my birthday, a few centuries ahead of my birthday, but, but on October 31st, Martin Luther said, this needs to change. And sadly, things did change. I love to look at St. Francis of Assisi, a true reformer. He saw a church that needed to change, and he changed the church to be closer to the sacred heart of Christ. That always needs to happen. With my individual life and our lives, we all need to come closer to the sacred art of Jesus. Celebrating the traditional Latin Mass and celebrating the Novus Ordo form of the Mass, I continue to grow in that relationship. Because I need to. If we aren't continuing to learn and grow deeper in Christ, where are we? Thankfully, obviously, I've got a whole lot still to learn, but I am still learning. Just this morning, as I was celebrating the traditional Latin Mass for maybe the 12th time, not many, but it struck me as Father guided me. There are prayers that the priest offers after the consecration. And Father simply said, and he's just trying to help out a bishop who doesn't really know what he's doing. But his words were beautiful and really struck me. He said, these prayers are directed to Jesus on the altar. And it just struck me, what I already believe and know, 
But what a beautiful moment in that liturgy. It's been simplified. For many of us would say too much, but I hope that I can learn whatever form of the Mass I'm celebrating to remember, and I try to. And by the grace of God, I've grown in knowing after those words of consecration, Jesus is there. And so I kneel for a few moments of adoration and prayer. But those beautiful prayers of the priest that are part of the traditional Mass, where the priest takes some time to give thanks for the Lord who's there, the same Jesus we heard about in the gospel telling us this morning, for those who are heavily burdened, know that your burden is light in me. That's a paraphrase of the gospel, but that's the basic message. All of us are heavily burdened. All of us have our worries. Those who came before us, those after us, will have their worries. But come to Jesus is always the message. We've got to be people of word and sacrament. And to be joyfully Catholic, always mining the treasures of both. We are both and. Not a Reformation that says word only. Because that forgets that the incarnate word, sacramentally, is with us. Jesus gave us the sacraments, and they remind us that he, and the incarnate word, is living body and blood, soul and divinity present with us. A beautiful part of God's word that I know we all know from Luke's gospel, the very end, the road to Emmaus. I'd like to conclude with some ideas that come to me from the road to Emmaus as I pray over that scripture. Let us first off be reminded that it's a living word. It's not just some story from the past. It's part of our family story. We all have family stories that we treasure, humorous and profound and everyday stories. The story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. One aspect of that story that I'd encourage all of us to re really reflect on and bring ourselves into. Only one of those disciples is named. Be the unnamed disciple walking with the Lord. As you read that passage, make it yours. Walk with the Lord. That's what I try to do in my prayer. I love to pray before Jesus in his Eucharistic face, before the Blessed Sacrament. We can do that with the Lord in a tabernacle or in a monstrance, but to pray before the Lord. He's really there. And maybe sometime when you have the opportunity, read that passage of the disciples on the road to Emmaus and be that unnamed disciple. Like us, they don't recognize him at first. But what does Jesus do? He talks to them about word and sacrament, about the Catholic faith. Here is the Lord catechizing in the most beautiful way that catechesis ever happened. He speaks of the Word as He is the Word, and it ends with the sacrament where they recognize Him in the breaking of the bread. I noticed in reflecting on that passage recently, It says in Scripture, at least the translation that I read, that it was seven hours. No, not seven hours, seven miles. Have you gotten your 10,000 steps in today? At least in my calculation, that's not quite seven miles. 
unless you take little steps, I guess. But one thing that occurs to me in that little detail of that passage from the Word of God that is Jesus is it takes a while to walk seven miles. Jesus, of course, at that moment is risen Lord. He didn't have to walk at all. And sometimes he didn't in those beautiful resurrection appearances. Sometimes he just appears and then disappears. But the beautiful humility of the Lord, who had already profoundly humiliated himself by death on the cross and rising from the dead, he's still our humble Lord, risen Lord, body and blood, soul and divinity glorified. He's willing to walk with them, knowing, like me, they don't even know who they're walking with. But in humility, he walks with them a good portion of those seven miles. Maybe he was in his glorified body getting a little tired. He's about to walk off, and they say, no, stay with us. That is what we say. Stay with us, Lord. And I have an idea that I can imagine a little smile on the Lord's face at that moment because he wasn't leaving. But we're always afraid he's leaving. He is always with us. But let's be reminded in that Emmaus story that we're all called to walk with the Lord, to let it take some time to let our prayer really deepen our relationship with him. I can imagine walking that distance that there were some pauses. Maybe they sat down to rest for a moment. The rhythm of our lives means that all of the ordinary moments, all of the things we experience, can be part of that journey. The Lord's humility in walking with those two disciples. And what did they say at the end of that passage? Our hearts were burning. Brothers and sisters, when we know the Lord, and I can say that, I've, as I've said to people many times, you know, I've... I'm not a mystic. I've never had an allocution. I've never seen a vision. But I will testify before you. My heart has burned. In the presence of the Lord, in a, a glimpse, in a moment of realizing who it is I hold in my sinful hands at the altar, who it is I'm gazing on in the monstrance, who it is I'm reading about in Scripture. All of Scripture, all the New Testament is about Jesus. As we were recently reminded, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. We have to be both and word and sacrament and let both feed us because both are Jesus. And I realize how much I need to allow that burning in my heart to not be extinguished by a dark and broken and sinful world and church all too often. As we face this scourge of modernism, I think that's the first time I've used that word in this context, but I know that's the thrust of this conference. How do we fight it? In the name of Jesus. As simple as that and as profound as that. I was thinking about modernism as I've traveled here. And really, it's just a fancier way of saying a pagan world. Modernism is, going, is about going back to the pagan, 
which Christ encountered, pagan Rome. Now we're in, sadly, pagan Rome, pagan United States, a pagan world. That's modernism, because modernism forgets about God and makes us God. Forgets about Christ and makes our hearts and the desires of our hearts all that matters. What a travesty. Even in Rome as I speak, they're talking about what's in your heart? Oh, what's in your heart? What's it? How do you feel? Get back to Jesus. Aloha, everyone. This is Jason Jones for LifeSide News. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more content like this, check the link in the description. You can also connect with us on social media to stay up to date with the latest news on life, faith, family, and freedom. Thanks for watching, and may God bless you.